Understanding the Kingdom is a passion for Marie Smith, resulting in his book, And They Dreamt of a Kingdom. Marie speaks to us today from Washington State. Maurice, I was in a doctor's office recently reading your book, and one of the doctors asked me what I was reading. I briefly explained how the kingdom of God existed before the church, but of course, there's more to it than that. How would you describe the difference between church and kingdom? Well, Steve, um, that's a good question. It's um, probably a challenge for most Christians to wrap their heads around what we're talking about here Essentially, the kingdom is the greater whole of which the church is a lesser part. Most of us have a mentality that limits the church to uh, the visible that we can see, our denomination, our community church that we're a part of, and we see things in very small parts. The kingdom of God is the big picture. It's what God has always been doing. One paragraph that really resonated with me illustrates how some of the so-called cutting-edge churches are approaching growth from the wrong direction. You say on page 47, it proceeds by taking surveys to learn what people want to hear. It culminates with a sermon series entitled, Yea God, complete with a giant loaf of Wonder Bread suspended from the ceiling to illustrate how wonderful God is. Then you go on to say, are the masses who respond to this reverse-engineered and highly processed spiritual white bread believers and disciples in the kingdom? Now, you visited a church where this actually happened, right? I did. That was a church here in uh, my hometown where I live. I was there, and it was, you know, a wonderful little message. But to me, it completely missed the grandeur of what the church is all about. Is God wonderful? Yeah, he's more wonderful than a loaf of Wonder Bread. But that's how small we think. I go back to Psalm 145, where the writer talks about, you know, we we will speak of the glory of your kingdom and of your majesty. And you can just almost imagine the psalmist's eyes glazing over with tears as he talks about this because it's the sweep of who God is. And we've reduced God to a loaf of Wonder Bread. What's that all about? Maurice, you received a master's degree in theology from Denver Baptist Seminary, so you're quite a scholar. You did some digging and identified the messianic signs that the rabbis were expecting the coming one to fulfill. What were they? And why was leadership still not convinced? The healing of a leper, the healing of a deaf mute, and the healing of a man born blind, those were the three signs that the rabbis had always taught would be a sign of the Messiah. Jesus did all three, and yet the power structure, that religion-shaped spirituality, looked at it, understood what they were seeing, and rejected it. And that's, to me, that's just profound. You emphasize throughout the book that Jesus was more interested in influencing the disciples, which numbered about a half dozen throughout most of the book, but eventually totaled 12, than he was in directly reaching the multitudes. What's the logic behind that? I believe the logic is very simple. The multitudes are finicky. They'll turn on you on a dime. And they did. Jesus invested himself in 12 people whom he trusted would imbibe everything that he was teaching them over three and a half years, and they would be able to pass it on. And that kind of discipleship, one-on-one teaching, can only happen in small groups. You cannot do that to a congregation of 200 or 2,000 or 20,000. But Jesus spent his time with small groups of people, and he poured himself into those small groups. He wasn't looking for followers. He wasn't looking for fans. He was looking for disciples whose lives would be transformed. Another theme of And They Dreamt of a Kingdom is that true discipleship always results in fruitfulness. How do we measure fruitfulness? One of the key ingredients in fruitfulness that is missing in much of the church today is our commitment to good deeds and serving the least of these. And so when I look for fruitfulness, I don't think fruitfulness is Bible studies per se. I mean, I'm all for Bible study. I've got a degree in it. I love Bible study. So if you don't have fruitfulness, if you don't have deeds that you're doing to manifest this faith that you claim to have, I think you got a problem. Maurice, 
Some people may think you are too strict in your definition of discipleship. Yeah. But I believe a little background would be helpful for understanding where you're coming from. You left the institutional church years ago to pursue God through the house church movement, where spiritual manifestations are not uncommon. Tell us about the angelic visitation that clarified your vision. It just started out as, I think it was eight of us together in a prayer meeting in my house and had no expectations. We just got together to pray. And about an hour into it, the atmosphere in the house changed and people were going, oh, what is that? There were several people there in our, in our small group who are um, what I call prophetically gifted. And all of a sudden, they're just about on the floor and they're weeping and it was an angelic manifestation. There were three angels, and their message was very simple. Holiness and fear, returning to God's holiness and fear, and fear of the Lord. Genuine personal repentance, and greater, deeper intimacy with God. And it was profound. The next week, we'd call each other up in tears, going, what was that? It bent me in a way that, even now as I'm sharing it with you, I I still get chills, because it was God speaking to us saying, I want to do something in my church that is going to transform how we do church. He wants to return holiness and the fear of God. He wants to return genuine personal repentance over sin. And he wants to call his church into greater, deeper intimacy with him. That's amazing. Thanks for sharing with us, Maurice. I've enjoyed talking with you. Steve, I appreciate your taking the time to give me a call and we can have this conversation. And I would love to have that conversation with anyone else who would like to have it. And feel free to visit our website at risingrivermedia.org. This is Steve Eastman for Wait Till You Hear This. Discover more stories like this one on our website, waittillyouhearthis.com. Thank you.